Hi, my name is Lee and today I will review or give you my thoughts on episode 7 of Star Trek Picard called Nepenthe, like the planet they were on. Um, this one is a tough one for me to rate. I usually use the scale 1 to 5 and so far episode 5 has been my favorite. It's the only one that got a 4 out of 5. This one, my initial reaction was to give it a 3 out of 5. I had one day to think about it though, and I have to give it a 2 out of 5. I'm sorry. Although of all the 2 out of 5s I gave so far, this one is my favorite. It's just the inner critic in me <laughs> cannot give it anything higher than that. Um. Let's start with what I liked. I really liked the nature of the episode. It was a calm, character-focused episode. It, it was well placed in the overall arc. We had action and now I assume the finale will be action-packed. So it's the calm before the storm and a little breather, a breather episode basically. And those are always important. It had some very genuine feeling moments between the characters. Uh, of course, it was fan service to show Riker and Troy, but uh, fan service usually has this negative connotation. Like people hate fan service in general, but I think it's more like a neutral term. Like there's good fan service and there's bad fan service. And. This was good fan service. Just seeing the characters, of course, it didn't really serve a purpose in like the plot, but for the characters and for the viewers, it was mostly for the viewers. F fan service, as I've said. But Riker and Troy, they seemed so warm and familiar, you know. Although, what happened to. <laughs> it's always so ridiculous to see. Picard, like Patrick Stewart, who looks amazing for his age. And then Riker, like, no offense to Jonathan Frakes and Marina Sirtis, but they did not age even remotely as well as Patrick Stewart did. <laughs> so, I liked that. That's pretty much it, but <laughs> that was most of the episode, cozy character moments. So that's why I really liked it as a first reaction. But even while watching it, I had a lot of problems with it. And while <laughs> sleeping a night over it and thinking about it, I had not even a lot of problems, but a few problems that are quite severe. <laughs> For example, Commodore O commits mind rape to another officer. We know she is either A, she is Romulan, in which case, cool, Romulans can do that. It makes sense, but it was never mentioned before. That's something they could have explored more, that they can do mind melts. Or she is Vulcan and a traitor, in which case it would be super interesting to know why a Vulcan would do that. <laughs> like, Vulcans are like the least treacherous or tra traitorous prone to being traitors of all the races of the Federation, I would think. And it wasn't really addressed, like she didn't mind control uh, the Tilly 2.0. It was more portrayed as she showed her images and then out of her own will, like, you know, it's basically like, fake news in her head. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good analogy. It's it's not. It's not a good analogy. But so basically she did not report this to the authorities. I mean, probably the authorities are all traitors for all we know, but she has been literally mind raped. That is a a mind melt without consent is basically rape and she's fine with it like what the heck that i had problems with that 
and how does the Borg Queen like it wasn't really said whether the coordinates you typed into the thing were manual in which case how did he know of that planet and that Riker would be living there and th that makes no sense I got more the impression that this was like a preset, a one of the exit nodes of the Borg Queen. Like if she was fleeing, and how hilarious would it be <laughs> if like some cube in the Delta Quadrant, you know, in the fight against Species Eight Four Seven Two, the Queen is on it, <laughs> and then she has to eject. And I I know the Species Eight Four Seven Two thing is uh, resolved against anything really and then the the queen does an emergency thing to Nepenthe and she and her bodyguard Borg walk through the forest assimilate Riker's kid blast their house to shreds and <laughs> it's it's just silly that the, the Borg queen teleportion device leads literally into Riker's garden like and it was it was portrayed as if that was a planet that isn't very populated and how lucky are they to just land there and not just you know a, a couple hundred kilometers off and they would have no chance of finding them in or at least in time it it makes zero sense it's a plot convenience <clears throat> Yeah, I, I just, when I thought about the Borg Queen <laughs> flying to Riker's house, <laughs> that, that was just hilarious. I didn't like the how dark it got once more with Troy or, and Riker losing their son. Like, why does everything have to be shitty in the future? Why does everyone have to be miserable? And the, the, the cure, the... Uh, it requires positronic stuff in the brain. Like, I'm not sure whether the Federation would have allowed such a treatment even pre-Mars event. Like, they are very against genetic stuff. I get, yeah, technology is not genetic, but they are very against modification of the brain and abilities and stuff. That sounded very fishy to begin with. And how convenient it's about androids, the story, and the positronic stuff, and you know. And how convenient that their kid had that sickness that happened to have that cure in this time where the law changed its plot conveniences. That's my number one problem with this episode. Yeah, it's very contrived. Everything about this episode is contrived and it was too dark for my taste. The, the stuff with Troy. Oh, and then, of course... Wait, did I... It didn't copy-paste this. Wait. I had more notes. One moment. Yeah, why is it so easy to shake off a pursuing ship wait why is it so easy to shake off a pursuing sh obviously it didn't work but rios wanted to shake the ship off by just stopping and flying another direction like why does that work it only didn't work because they were traced but <laughs> but we were led to believe we the viewers that it would have worked otherwise just stopping can shake off a pursuer. How dumb is that? That that was just bad writing. Um, why did Elnor just vanish after last episode? Like he and Hugh were together and were facing the attackers, the evil Romulans, and then in this episode he's conveniently doing whatever. We are not told what he's doing. Just so Hugh's friends can be slaughtered, the XBs. I, I, it's supposed to be traumatic. Oh my god, they kill these poor people. Those poor X-Borgs. But it just falls flat because it makes no sense. Elnor, you had one job. One damn job and you didn't do it. 
just let them be killed. And that was also so dark and edgy, you know. Oh, we have to kill all his friends. Yeah, that's that's good character development. Yeah. Just murder. Yeah, it, like he just pretended to be busy. He just came around the corner and like, oh, he just, explain this, please. <sighs> Tilly 2.0 almost ruined everything in this episode. Again, I hate her. I hate her so much. I hate her. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. It was kind of funny to see her dying. Like she's obviously not dead, sadly. The EMH, I already automatically like him less because he saved her. But at least she's comatose, so maybe I don't have to deal with her for an episode or two. Rios and Ruffy were okay in this episode. How the heck can Riker afford to have a house that can scan for Romulan cloaking devices? Why can't anyone scan for those? I mean, it's a cloaking device for a reason, you know? So you, you don't find the thing that it's cloaking. It's how that works. Why can a little kid communicate with a random captain just like with a communicator thingy and in real time so he has to be close again unless they have their own sophisticated subspace network which Riker paid with selling pizza or whatever. So yeah, that, those are all my notes actually. I, I really have to stress I liked the calmness, the character moments. I thought the kid was okay, which is rare for Star Trek to have okay kids. And seeing Troy and Riker it was great. Soji and Picard, like it there was actually character development. And it was a much needed breather. I really liked the inclusion of this breather episode after last one and before the finale. Obviously, there's one more before the two-parter finale comes. But I, I hate this story or the plot conveniences. It's not even a plot convenience, it's a plot contrivance. I like the cute Discovery reference, I got that. I watched season one of Discovery, didn't watch season two, but I watched the Gormagander thing. See, references like that, that's that's always cool. It's little, well, not, not really an Easter egg, but... Somehow my thoughts keep getting shorter. <laughs> I'm so mad at this episode because I liked it. It could have been my second favorite episode after episode 5. But now that I know how little sense it makes because I thought about it, I don't like it. It's better than the other shit about like the Tilly episode or like those awful early ones. Basically episodes 2 to 4, 2, 3 and 4 are pretty bad. Episode 1 was great, episode 5 was great, episode 6 I didn't like, episode 7 is this weird thing between I almost really like it but I have to dislike it. Hope you enjoyed my thoughts. Look forward to more videos from me. And subscribe down below. Hit the bell if that's still a thing. I don't know. And yeah. I might do... I will probably do a video not related to Star Trek soon. But maybe that will pull in viewers. I'm not doing it for viewers. I'm doing it for myself. It's a personal video. But look forward to that. My name is Lee, live long, and prosper. Bye.